Hey guys, it's Shama here, CEO of Scaling Retail, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of demand side development. And a lot of this is coming off the heels of the New York Times article that was written about the state of the industry and how designers and how the entire market of fashion really is, is kind of, has been imploding, if you will. Now, if you guys haven't heard the article, you haven't read it yet, it is available actually on like an audio version on the New York Times daily podcast on um, this past Sunday. And so for a reference point, I'd say go back there and, and take a look at it. What was really awesome about this article is it talked so much about my kind of prime heyday in, in the industry. Um, starting back in like 2005 and kind of looking at how markets shifted over time. Um, this article really chronicles uh, what it was like to be a part of uh, New York Fashion Weeks and what the industry was like, but really it goes very specific into some laser concepts that I think a lot of new designers and brands have uh, heard about, but not really had a lot of exposure into. And so when we're starting to look at how these markets are imploding, um, first of all, read this article. Um, it's all about, uh, it's called Sweatsuits, and um, it really chronicles Scott Sternberg's experience going from Band of Outsiders to um, moving on to Entire World and, and kind of how he tried to reshift the um, mechanics of the retail industry. Um, but what's very interesting is at the end of this article, it really leaves us with this major question. And the question is, how do we create an industry that allows us to support not only the creativity of what designers or fashion or expression is, simultaneously provides to consumers products that they want to purchase that are not only practical, but also have that emotional component, right? Um, in the article, they talk about fashion is not like toilet paper. That's correct, right? It's hard to know kind of what consumption looks like. So creating products and brands that are consumer centric Right, and they're focused on the consumer, and then also creating business models on the back end that are actually working and kind of co-creating uh, with the retailers, with consumers, and and with brands. And I think that there's a, tri a trifecta there. Um, the name of the article, gosh, it started it's something like uh, something about sweatsuits, um, but it, it's a big article. If you look at the New York Times Daily podcast, um, you'll see it was done as like an audio. Um, and audio to podcast just, just this past Sunday. Um, and what I think is is so interesting is we get to this confluence of how do we develop and design product, brand, as well as uh, business models that actually help to support all of it. And so my biggest concern here is, well, where do you go for consumer market research? It used to be that in the past, you would have a designer who said, okay, I'm a designer, I'm going to go ahead and design this collection and then I'm going to find a way to sell it. Oftentimes I get customers like that as well. I'll get newfound brands and designers who say, I want to, I have this vision and I want to take this vision to market. How do I take it to market? So when you kind of come at it from that perspective, right, and you say, I want to grow this into something big, inevitably you find yourself in a nasty game of looking at inventory overages, needing to anticipate that you're going to throw away dollars, um, whether that be markdown money, return to vendors, um, a whole host of reasons of how you kind of have to plan for losing money, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty insane as an industry that we plan to lose money because we know that we need to in order to play this certain game. Now, when you look at, again, this confluence of consumer demand, retailers and brands and how they kind of all work together, you then also have another layer on top of that, which happens to be private equity firms and companies who are now almost pulling the strings of fashion by virtue of using it as an opportunity to file money through from other endeavors. So that's kind of where fashion gets a little bit murky. Most people don't really deep dive into those things until they start to hear stories of companies like Donna Karen or Diane von Furstenberg and uh, even Nanette Lepore when you start to realize just how fragile it is um, when you start to bring out, bring in outside capital because all of a sudden your business being profitable is not necessarily their best interest. What's in their best interest is that in their portfolio of investments, your business serves a purpose, which could ultimately be 
bankrupting the business, um, diluting the brand, bankrupting your ideas, etc. cetera. So it's very hard to know where the synergy is. But again, we come back to this question of what is the answer to a market that is so, uh, that is so rooted in I have this idea and I wanna see it to market. Now, those of you who've been following along know that I took this past summer a uh, Harvard Business School class on innovation theory, and I'm currently in a master class uh, taught by Bob Mesta. Now, he's one of the, the founding uh, people of um, the jobs to be done theory. And so what I'd like to put forward, what I'd like to put forward is a new concept of demand-driven fashion. And I know that doesn't sound necessarily too, uh, too new, right? I mean, obviously we wanna produce things that are in demand, right? But the notion that we actually can have through this series of you know, um, customer interviews, which is what the jobs to be done process kind of maps out, customer interviews pegged against timelines, pegged against kind of the core causality or reason for purchasing and understanding the functionality by segmentation, right? So it's not simply to say that each of these brands is going to all be competing for the same customer market. We still have segmentation, but being able to kind of uh, niche down your segmentation and develop and create products and services and components for them um, is ultimately where we need to be shifting our psychology. Um, on an almost daily basis, I'm talking to people who are asking me, well, where's the industry heading? And I'm saying, well, it depends on how you are producing and designing and developing new goods. It's simply, un it's impossible to think that this industry will sustain itself based on either that kind of higher end luxury model of being very niche and specific at a very, very high price point because that's what smaller quantities beg to do, Right? And it's also hard to imagine that the industry is just going to totally flip only to mass consumption and production and we're all going to be buying cheap things at, at Target. Um, so we have to really be looking at kind of segmentation in, in the customer marketplace, but then driving deeper as brands in order to actually be creating products that people want to purchase. Now, well, what does that mean? It means that everyone out there today who's just kind of, I feel like doing this and I'm gonna put it out there and see what works. You're treating your business like a hobby, um, like an expensive hobby, because ultimately without diving deeper into customer psychology, you are taking a gross assumption on the fact that you somehow understand the causality of your customers because maybe you're thinking you yourself are the customer. And that, my friend, is, is a faulty way of, of thinking about it, right? You might be the original customer but all the bells and whistles and the things that you wish that product had, maybe over engineering the solution to the customer. And while you might ask yourself, well, you know, Shama, you're wearing a cream colored sweatshirt. Well, what's the, you know, uh, what makes this product or what's the, the causality behind this versus buying any other cream colored sweatshirt, right? So understanding why someone is purchasing beyond benefits and features. What is the job or the role that your product will be playing or is currently playing with your customer market? That is the answer you need to find out. So this notion of selling customers on benefits and features, right, which is what we're used to doing, is different than selling customers in language that resonates with why they are actually purchasing and using that language, the causality language, and reflecting that back in front of your customer ultimately is what gets the conversion. And I think, guys, when we think about what is the solution to this problem of overproduction, um, what is the solution to having so many options, so much variety, so much abundance, it's that the retailers do not actually know why their customers are purchasing from them. So retailers don't know, the brands don't know either, right? And when you start to look at the causal mechanisms between and looking at that lens of, of that jobs to be done methodology, all of a sudden you move away from I think I know to I actually know because you actually have the rationing and, and the reason behind it. So building the, the new wave of looking at, at business models and how we are evolving our retail industry is going to be largely based on our ability as brand owners and as retailers 
to have the opportunity to say, well, what is the, in my current segment, what is the causality and how do I actually design, purchase and produce based on inventory needs for my specific customer based on the kinds of products and services that they're looking to buy. So why is this important? Because we have overproduction of garments based on faulty customer market information that then gets translated into hype marketing that then causes buyers to buy more, to differentiate, to then back up our supply chain and then end up with overabundance of inventory that gets sold off and that then erodes uh, these designers and their P&Ls and then also erodes uh, the market in general. So as you're starting to think about this notion of a retail bubble, you know, we are in it, you know, we, we are in the retail bubble. Um, it is shifting, right? As we're starting to notice through COVID, which is very interesting, there was a huge shift, right? There was this big segment shift in terms of how people were starting to purchase products, right? So this New York Times article is all about, you know, um, uh, entire world. And, and to be honest, I actually bought uh, sweatsuits from them. So that was kind of funny. Um, it's funny to see that. But, um, but the notion of our uh, consumption, right? Now that we actually have like a big global stressor on the economy and on our health, now all of a sudden people are taking a step back and saying, okay, well, I'm seeing a 360 degree stressor in my life. How am I reshifting my consumption and my habits? And the truth of it is that there are e-commerce companies today that are having better businesses this moment than they ever have historically. And the reason why, partially it's because of luck, um, and partially it's because they actually understood a customer market need, right? So like the causality, why is someone purchasing? The customer market need has been identified and they drove that language and that niche and that copy specifically into that one particular customer. Now, as we kind of look to the future and we ask ourselves, well, from a business modeling standpoint, does that mean I have to entirely shift the kinds of products that I am producing? Well, possibly, you know, what it does mean is that you either need to uh, get really hip and quick on jobs to be done uh, theory and how to apply that methodology into your business so you can understand causality. Um, hire someone who can help you with this. Um, and if you do not kind of take that next step to understanding why your customers are purchasing, you run the risk of designing out of, um, self-importance. And when you design out of self-importance, you either must have a, uh, a great bench or a great, you know, sort of, uh, capital resources to continue to fuel your vision, your creativity. Um, but what I have actually found is when you go through the process of putting together the design requirements, that friction for a creative to say, I need you to create a product that is not more than this in terms of design functions, not less than this, it needs to sit in the sweet spot. Now push yourself, show me what you can design and what you can do that's going to fit squarely into this niche of what customers are looking for. Now that is going to be where a lot of emergent um, innovation comes out of, right? Your creative who is strong and visionary gets met with customer um, restraints, right? It gets met with this box of how we need to fulfill the customer journey. Now, what we've been seeing, right? And this is more and more applicable as we think of retail shifting, but as we look to see this next wave of design development and production, I'm really, really advising the majority of brands out there to take on this type of um, this work internally because the majority of brands that were in ready to wear an apparel when COVID happened, shift their supply chain in order to develop PPE. However, you can't really comp last year's numbers by developing PPE, but that happens to be a really great response to a customer market need. Shifting your supply chain, shifting your resources and realigning towards a new goal. Now, what we've been seeing is the majority of these retailers or these brands have now been shifting away from PPE because they need to go back into producing um, within their organizational chart and the supply chain that they had built up. So 
You now have a vacancy, right? There's liquidation of PPE, what's happening in that market, who's gonna continue to produce. And you have these brands shifting back to their old way of doing things. What I'm proposing is there's a new way to approach it. It's not simply that the system is broken, it's that the system needs to be uh, cohesively fixed. Um, you can't just change the buying. And I think the one thing, the one thing that our industry is extremely passionate about the one thing that our industry exists for and because right our industry is rooted in the customer and demand demand side designing demand side development understanding where we actually will find opportunity um, through the customers through their struggle through the emotional connection to that product whether it's a functional connection, a social connection, an emotional connection, that is where we're going to see the most success as we emerge out of COVID and into a new way of doing business, a new way of looking at product development um, and creating sustainable and profitable businesses. Because we will see at the end of this year, a lot of small businesses will be shutting their doors never to return again. And we will see a lot of brands going back to producing what used to be bestsellers that people no longer care about. And that to me pegs itself back into the historical issues of our industry, which is how do we comp LY? How do we comp these categories? How do we continue to preserve the fragility of this uh, ancient industry as opposed to looking forward and saying, how, is, how are the consumers shifting and changing? What are their needs right now? What are they looking for right now? And through that lens, through the lens of them, we will get better, right? It doesn't mean we can't be creative. It doesn't mean we can't come out with some fun iteration of something that we love, but it is so important that we actually strive to find the sweet spot between design, restraints and qualifications to service the customer met with the creative who can then imprint that onto that product. It's a collaboration, but it's no longer a tops down strategy that is going to work anymore. Um, okay. Question. Um, how can new emerging brands figure out what their customers like? It's a great question. So this concept of jobs to be done, uh, methodology, it's what's interesting is, the framing of what do they like, you know, it is le less to do with benefits and features, and it has more to do with the outcome of the product that they're purchasing. So there are a number of different of market research sites, and it doesn't take that much time or money um, to put some resources out there and say, I'm going to spend $500 on doing some market research. And I'm going to get on the phone with, you know, I don't know, 10 different people, give them each 50 bucks uh, for their time. And I want to talk to someone who has purchased this particular kind of product. I want to talk to someone who has purchased this kind in this kind of market. And so what you're looking for, right? And this is hard. This is not like a, what's hard here is I remember like the first time I had the privilege of sitting in on one of these phone calls and I thought that like, you know, finding out the benefit in the feature was like what I needed to know to make the product better. When actually guys, what you needed and what I needed to know was like, how were they feeling and what were they looking for the product to do, right? It's like, it's not necessarily what are the benefits and features. It's more like, what is the role that the product is playing, right? So it's having those conversations. It's knowing how to have those conversations, how to kind of synthesize the timelines and the needs of the customer and being able to emerge out of that with, again, copy. So talk about like stellar conversion oriented copy as well as design requirements that are there in order to be able to like really kind of turbo your focus because that also has organizational implications. If all of a sudden the entire organization is now shifting towards working on this particular goal, you're gonna realign your internal infrastructure and you're gonna realign your marketing and all of your assets towards this one goal. So unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as like send out a survey, right? You have to have these phone calls. You need to be working with someone who is experienced in these, um, but this is, this is the next wave. And again, like when I look at how we will emerge as an industry, 
it's going to be truly not just based on customer market segmentation, household income, and what we think we know of our customers, and even like what our customers say that they know. Our customers don't know what they like. They just don't. Um, they know how they want to feel. They know what they want that product to do for them, but they don't actually know what they like, right? They haven't been exposed to your thing. They don't know, right? They don't know what the other options are. So I would say, you know, uh, please like uh, rethink how you're looking at customers and how you are looking at product development. And while we might be hearing that this retail industry is erupting, it is, and it is for good reason. You know, we need to cut back on mass overproduction. We need to shift back on looking at taking losses in an industry just because it can historically be a place where we can hide cash, right? Where we can uh, hide resources, um, where a company and a small brand will tank and, and go into deep debt uh, because it served for the betterment of the investors who were investing in them. Um, it's time to take a step back. And that means you have to do it more thoughtfully. That means you take your ego out of it and you say, I'm in this industry to produce something beautiful for a customer, for someone to buy it, right? That is the goal for someone to buy it. Anyway, guys, thanks for, thanks for tuning in, hearing my thoughts. Um, really exciting, but that is what's going on in my world. And, and those are the ways in which we are looking at really furthering the conversations around how retail is evolving, product development is evolving, um, and how we're going to be building better, sustainable businesses is ultimately where we wanna be. All right, guys, I will talk to you later. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.